everybody, and welcome to this live event on Smart Cities. Uh, my name is Maria Lasarte, and I'm ISO Social Media Manager. And I'm here today with Andrew Kalinch, who is the Smart City Lead for the Greater London Authority. Hello, Andrew. Hi there. Hi there, everyone. Um, Andrew runs the Intelligence Unit um, of Greater London Authority, whose job is to manage and exploit city data so that it fits policy and strategy development. So we have an exciting conversation up ahead. If you have any questions, please add them in the YouTube feed here below. Uh, if we run out of time, we can always answer them offline. So let's get started. Uh, Andrew, everybody seems to be talking about smart cities. It's like the big thing right now. But the concept is quite abstract for many of us. How would you explain a smart city? This is one of, one of the things that I have been working on for a, a long time now. How do you actually communicate to a politician or a policy customer what you mean by a smart city? How do you stop it being a conversation where that politician or that policy customer just says, you're just talking about technology, Andrew, or you're just talking about data. It's all very interesting, but what I'm interested in is outcomes. So actually, um, when I'm describing a smart city, I really try to tone down mentions of data and artificial intelligence and machine learning and technologies like blockchain and I like to concentrate on outcomes for people uh, and basically saying that this is about the sensible deployment of technology, uh, digital technology and data in pursuit of better societal, better economic uh, and indeed better financial outcomes. Um, so, what does this concretely mean uh, for London? You know, what, are, what would you say are the smart priorities for the City of London and why? Okay, right. Well, I mean, I, I suppose I'll sort of touch back in on that first question that, the, that you asked me. The smart priorities for London are those issues which are of the highest political and policy concerns within City Hall. So a very obvious one at the moment would be air quality, for example. So not something that you would traditionally um, talk about in a smart conversation with a technology business, but one where here um, the mayor is highly exercised about improving um, the cleanliness of London's air so that Londoners can breathe better. So what we're doing around that is working with the Alan Turing Institute, which is one of our sort of national centers for excellence in data science. And we're trying to establish through data science where more cost-effective um, networks of sensors should be placed in London so that they can correspond to the high-quality sensor networks that we already have in place, but which aren't very numerous. So we've got a few what I call Rolls-Royces part far apart. With data science, we're trying to understand how we fill the gaps between those Rolls-Royces with a cheaper model. Um, and the reason why we're doing that is because actually this isn't always about traffic pollution. It's also about the pollution that will come off buildings. It's also about uh, pollution that will be generated through inefficient heating systems, so on and so forth. So actually, that's a really good example of where we've got a smart priority um, that is linked to one of those policy outcomes. E-mobility would be another very obvious thing to land on. It's really linked to that environment, environmental issue called air quality. And they recently introduced a toxicity charge understanding how new forms of mobility can sit alongside um, established timetables and transport options provided by the likes of Transport for London is really important to us. And again, there's a good example here of a business that started out as a data business, um, City Mapper. Um, it's an app that's on most people's phones here in London. It allows them to get around. It has used the data that is generated from customers as well as the uh, open data that city government provides to understand that there is extra demand out there in London for flexible on-demand bus routes. So those are now on the streets of London running alongside traditional bus routes. So again, a good example of how sort of smart bleeds into sharing economy, bleeds into data economy um, to create things that Londoners and visitors to London want to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's uh, very interesting and I think you've covered some of the uh, issues that I'm going to ask you about next because actually we've been organizing a, a campaign called uh, Hashtag World Smart City uh, for the 
past two, three weeks now. Um, and this is to raise a bit awareness about, uh, you know, like some of the main issues that we're talking about um, when it comes to smart cities as well as the connection to standards. And today we were talking a lot about urban mobility, uh, which is uh, one of the big ones. And I wanted to ask a little bit more about this subject. What does it mean to you? And uh, you've covered a little bit uh, the issue of immobility, but can you maybe explain a little bit more about how this is going to affect um, London? Sure, of course. Well, um, the, the example that I just gave to you is quite a good one about how you bring onto the streets of London um, more transport options, not always provided directly by the transport authorities that help meet the demand that's out there. And then, of course, there is e-mobility and how you provide carbon neutral uh, transport options for Londoners and to do so in a way that's convenient to them. So um, you're using European money, one of the things that we're doing here in London is bringing e-bikes onto the streets of London to sit alongside you know, the, the more traditional um, bike hire service that we have that sort of opens up, I suppose, pedal transportation to people who wouldn't normally use those bikes. And basically it allows displacement from or movement from one transport mode to another transport mode. So it helps again with you know those things that politicians care about, which is having a healthy group of Londoners and um, to move people away from uh, carbon producing forms of transportation. So I think those sort of EV mixes, whether it's bikes, whether it's car sharing schemes, um, whether it is the other forms of public transportation, I think are, are, are really quite important. Um, the other aspect of urban mobility that I think sits within the transport network and that, that it's interesting to explore is how you use data to understand how people are moving around the transport network. And I'll use the example of a trial that um, Transport for London have just carried out in which they collected uh, 509 million pieces of uh, depersonalized uh, media access call out data from people's mobile phones as they move beyond the gate line and, have, and, and, and into the uh, tube network. That's important because it allows the transport planners to think about sort of next stage of um, live transport uh, information feeds that they can supply to customers. So how do they get around the tube most effectively is actually a question well worth asking. I think in this particular experiment from point A to point B, we found that about 40% of the traveling and the visiting public were going by the, um, by uh, routes other than the most expeditious or the most direct routes. So, you know, people might have good reason for doing so, but we need to arrive at the understanding about how and why people are moving around so that we can say, this is the best way for you to move from point A to B. Here is on the platform where you'll most find, where, where you'll find best access to uh, your connecting train. And um, here's where you'll find the, empty, the, the emptiest carriage. Um, this is how you should just generally move around the transport network in a way that is most advantageous to you. And that at the moment sits within the transport network. As I say, that happens when you move beyond the gate line, that tracking of individuals raises some quite serious questions about the careful treatment of people's data, keeping it depersonalized and keeping it safe. But it also offers up in the potential to use that data as people move around the city environment. So as they move from their front door um, onto the transport network and then out the other side and onto their final destination. So all aimed with helping people move around, be mobile in the city in, in a way that is most comfortable for them and helps us manage the urban aspect. Control. So it seems like uh, smart cities have a lot of this uh, data, big data um, that is being used to improve and make uh, streamlined services, um, yeah. also sharing data. And this, uh, of course, raises uh, a lot of issues and, and there's uh, a lot of questions that international standards uh, can help address. <laughs> Um, and of course, this is one of the main subjects that we wanted to discuss here today are how can standards offer the right solutions to cities? And um, ISO, IC and ITU, which are the, you know, the main standards uh, developers, will be hosting a World Smart City event uh, in November uh, that will bring different stakeholders together to identify 
the challenges that cities are facing and determine how standards can best support them. You will be speaking at that event and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this and who should be joining, who should be at this event and why do you think it's important? Well, I mean, I, I, I think it's really important because there is a need to emphasize the role that standards can play in addressing some of the challenges that uh, are faced in cities and indeed in taking advantage of some of the opportunities that technology offers in cities. And there's a real need for cities to um, self-organize, I think, um, around how we approach technology, how we keep up with technology as it sort of moves on in leaps and bounds. And I think one of the things that really concerns me at the moment, and I'm the man from the government, so I'm allowed to talk like this, um, is that you know those things like governance and regulation, in fact, which stand, in which standards play a really important part, we need to take a fresh look at those things so that all of them keep up and indeed anticipate on occasion how technology is going to change in the future. Um, so that I think is uh, the main premise. It's one where there is both sort of opportunity and the need to get governance and regulation in cities right um, and standards have a key role to play in that. Um, and of course I'm talking about you know smart cities and how you know they will happen to us anyway unless we could have, unless we get this right so who should attend i mean i i think anybody from cities who has an interest in technology or indeed who sees it as their responsibility to consider technology to consider data and how it is to be used in the future development of policy and practice and service delivery in their cities and i think there's an interesting distinction to be made here as well in that quite often people like me will talk about um, services um, public services I think in the future you know, and we have started to uncover this in, in our discussion so far we will find ourselves talking more and more and more about urban services in which the entities are responsible at least in part for the delivery of those services and that means again that we need to have the right sort of standards in place so that everybody understands the rules by which they're playing. And there's a key balancing point in here as well, in that we need to make sure that the needs of cities are articulated clearly. And when I say the needs of cities, I sort of underscore and underline and put in bold the word cities. And because too often we approach these things individually, or there's too much emphasis that comes from the supply side, from industry, this is a critical moment, I would argue, in our urban history where we need to make sure that we get this right, that groups of cities come together to say, these are our policy needs, these are our sort of technology needs in relation to those policy needs, the things we want to achieve. Here is the start of the conversation, the discussion about standards that we think need to develop to support us in pursuit of those aims. Thank you, Andrew, for that. I mean, I think that's a very good explanation. And it emphasizes that it's not about just us offering solutions, but getting cities on board to be part of the solution and to have a say on what is uh, the answer. So I think that is quite important. And if anybody watching here uh, wants to attend the event in November, we will put the link uh, to register and to sign up at the end of this uh, event. So. I suppose I should say as well that you know, it, it, I, the thing about balancing is one that I do think is really, really important. And you know, I, I've been part of some of these conversations through, for example, the work of the European Innovation Partnership on urban platforms, which is all about how data should be used in cities. And this is an opportunity for both sides. It's not necessarily about violently redressing the balance between industry and city government. It's about working in a collaborative manner so that both um, city governments benefit in the way that I probably described a little bit too much here, but also so that industry can benefit as well around that clearer articulation of what cities actually want to see delivered in there in the urban environments for which they're responsible. Exactly. I mean, it makes sense to have everybody on board in the decision making table and all the uh, solution providers as well as the people who benefit from the solutions. And that is what we are trying to achieve here. So maybe um, we can go now a little bit to what the biggest challenges that you think smart cities will face in the coming years, because I think this will shape 
in the end what we're trying to achieve in terms of you know getting the solution providers on board, getting the cities on board. What do you think are the biggest uh, challenges and priorities for cities? Okay, well, I mean, I, I think in terms of challenges to be addressed in urban environments, then there are some very clear ones. And again, we've we've discussed these already. Um, it has to be around mobility and keeping the city moving. Uh, traffic speeds are slowing, there is more pressure on the transport infrastructure right the way across um, the majority of cities um, and technology can certainly help in that regard. I think um, and air quality as well is something um, that has to be addressed and uh, I think there is just so much political emphasis on that now um, that um, that it's just not going to go away. We, we have to sort of uh, get better at um, managing clean air in cities. The other thing that doesn't often get mentioned because it's a bit, it's a little bit more of a background issue um, is, although it's coming to the fore, is obviously cyber security. And I think we are getting to a stage where um, cities um, need to be, again, much clearer about um, a new set of governance and data management um, arrangements in cities that on a sort of technical and practical level will allow for the free flowing of data around the city so that you can exploit the value of it um, to create the new use cases around smart cities that we, that we have a very strong um, intuition are out there and, are, and that will drive the next stage of innovation in, in, in and around smart cities. But we critically need to make sure that the data that we are sending around the city architect, city data architecture is well protected and that individual privacy and security, household privacy and security right up to the commercial interests are all protected um, in a way that um, people's expectations, even though they might not articulate them immediately, um, are, not, are uh, still very much there and they will come to the foreground when things go wrong. So I think cities have to get this right and it's not an easy task. And uh, just to extend my answer a little bit further, uh, if you think about algorithms, um, they are being used in public services now, but often on the end of the algorithm is a human helping to make the decision. Um, I think we need to be prepared for the time when it will just be the algorithm that is making the decision on behalf of public services. And again, we need to have the right sort of, uh, sort of standards framework uh, in place to make sure that we are happy that that algorithm is delivering an answer that is acceptable to city government and that is defensible by city government to the individuals and the households and other stakers for whom it also has to be acceptable. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for that explanation. Uh, I think it's fascinating. We are moving into an era that's going to be like more technology dominated. Um, a lot of the issues that you mentioned, like for instance, air quality, there are already a lot of standards where um, that can help cities. We have standards for ensuring air quality. But what do you see uh, the, as the role of uh, standards? How can they help? Like, what kind of solutions do they offer? What are the benefits? Okay. Right. Well, you know, I, the the things that or the things that I think standards can help us do are to increase the confidence for decision makers, um, especially around what they see as, or the, what they can see in the smart cities context as emerging or, or at least propositions that need to be better understood. I think they also support collaboration across public sector actors as well. And, and my background is more so in data. And quite simply, uh, unless you have got standardized data that by and large takes the same form, then in a city like London, where we've got 33 municipal authorities, all delivering public services, all sharing the same sort of policy issues and opportunities, um, then unless you've got data that talks to each other because there are standards in place, then you can't use that data to answer pressing questions around areas like adult social care, for example. They also help to clearly uh, define needs so that you can approach procurement um, of smart city services more effectively. Um, and they'll basically just help to, as I said earlier in my uh, sort of point about balancing industry and uh, city needs, and they help shape the market and they help 
to do so in a way that is beneficial for both sides. And I don't think there's a strong enough appreciation of that sometimes. But you know, I suppose my broadest point is this is about preparing for the future and making sure that you know the smart cities of the future come to life in a way that cities want them to life. 5G, for example, would be a classic area for exploration about how uh, 5G networks should be configured, what they should look like, and what standards we should try and put in place around the data that would flow from them, because that next generation of urban service is probably waiting to be explored, um, uh, discovered um, on the back of the creation of those 5G networks. So they're very sort of future focused as well. Well, they help us focus on the future. Thanks for, for that explanation. Um, and I think uh, you're right when you say that sometimes like people don't think about the standards because they often work behind the scenes. So mm -hmm. if everything works and it goes smoothly, uh, that means that they're in place and that things are going well. And it's only when something is missing and uh, you, you know things don't work together that you realize that they are not there. Um, and I think that a lot of the priorities that uh, and the challenges that you emphasize were quite interesting in terms of uh, and the role that data will have. Especially, I think resilience is, is a big issue. That's one that we're going to cover next week. But I think where the, the city of the future has to be prepared for any eventuality. Um, so uh, even the algorithms that you mentioned that you know having nobody behind it, no human to make sure that everything is there. So what do you think um, the, uh, cities can learn from each other's experience and can standards help them in, in this regard? Um, how can cities learn from one another? Did, did, did you ask, sorry? Yeah, sorry. So like, for instance, one of the advantages of standards is that they can help cities compare data so that you can learn what you know, um, Manchester is doing compared to what London is yeah. doing. Uh, do you mm. see that as being a benefit? Uh, what would you say is the like what what can what can cities get out of that of that comparison and and how can standards help them? Okay, well, I mean, all, all this is about this is about the means to collaborate. I think around the development of use cases. Um, because for, for all that I've said over the course of the last 20 minutes, we always need more and more and more use cases. And cities who are engaging seriously around the smart cities agenda um, do so in the acknowledgement that they don't have all the answers yet. So collaboration is absolutely key. To be able to do so around a set of shared standards is really, really important. And this is why I really like the work that we've been doing for the European Innovation Partnership, where I lead on the uh, sort of city needs side of um, a piece of work that is about understanding how data is to be used in cities. So there, uh, with industry, you know, we have been working on the sort of technical and non-technical requirements. And as a group of cities, we have sort of come up with about 100 of those. Um, importantly, on top of that, then what we've done is sort of concentrate on, I suppose, the political cell, the operational cell. And we have created a leadership guide. And we've also created a sort of management framework that's full of all the sorts of tools that you need to establish um, a data platform that will allow you to use data in cities. And none of that really happens without a standards focus. Um, but building on that work, say it's back to that point that I've just made really about how we always need new user things, politicians or the policy customers and say, well, actually, in here about how you use algorithms to understand and uh, and control the flow of energy on local energy on, on, on local smart energy grids um, they make these things real so plenty that cities need to collaborate on um, I, the thing that I love about technology is that whilst there will always be a certain extent of rivalry between cities I think a lot of the people who are involved in the field of digital technology and data recognize that we can become famous together if you want to put it like that um, in that there is a lot to gain through collaboration and as I say standards are a, you know, a core part of making sure that that collaboration happens successfully Indeed, I think uh, at the heart of ISO and the work that we do is collaboration 
institution and this idea of bringing all stakeholders together to find solutions and achieve consensus. Um, and this brings me to maybe my last question, and that is one of the issues that we're struggling with as standards developers is to increase mm -hmm. awareness of standards among city planners as well as increased participation of cities in standards development. So what would you say uh, organizations like ISO, IC, and ITU can do to address this issue and to bring more people uh, from cities on board? Yeah, it, the, this, this is a tricky one um, because the easy thing to say would be speed it up, make sure that these things happen quickly because in the it, it's like in in the world of um, sort of web development, for example, then you know, agile is one of those key words, and pivoting is another one that that are used frequently to say that you know we move through a phase of a project and we adapt, and then we sort of move off in another direction, and and quickly we we improve, and and the standards development process is one where there is you know, a, an awful lot of very necessary thought and consideration that goes into the development of that standard and the engagement with the various stakeholders. Um, so if there's a way of sort of concertina and shortening the, the process, then I, I think we should look at what that is. And you mentioned how to get cities more involved. And I think you know, th th this is all about, um, again, where I started, it's about a means to an end and making it abundantly clear to cities as customers that engaging in the standards debate ultimately helps them to engage with the market in a way that they currently can't. And in a city like London, that, I, I think that should be a collective endeavour where you know, we as a group of public authorities in London, let alone cities A, B, and C should be um, sort of collaborating around the development of the sorts of standards that they want to see in what is in a city like London. Essentially, it's the same canvas, it's the same urban setting. So you know, it's in our interest to attack these things together, but it has to be about those policy outcomes. It has to be about the things that matter to politicians. So even though you know you, you might not um, sort of traditionally look at something like social care um i think the sort of next stage of smart cities development should be one that very much concentrates on those human services we tend to concentrate on infrastructure on street lights and and, and things like that which and transports and networks all of which are of, are, are of course important but actually thinking about how some of the disruptive business models out there um, might play out in a public services or a human public services environment is really quite interesting. And I think when you start to do that, you start to fire the imagination of the political decision makers, the chief executives of some of the authorities um, operating in cities, and that way standards becomes relevant to them. Well, thank you very much, sir. That's an interesting perspective, uh, going more from the technical side into the social side. Uh, but that's exactly what we need cities like you and others to get involved to come and tell us what the priorities are so that we can all work together and see how we can best address these issues. How can we uh, work into being agile while maintaining consensus and the, you know, the long um, consensus building process that we have that uh, you know, results in international standards. So thank you very much, Andrew, for your time. I think we're arriving towards the end of this event. It has been really, really interesting. And for all of you watching that also feel like you want to get involved, like you want to have a say, uh, please join us at the event in November in Barcelona at the World Smart City Forum. The link will be provided here and you will be able to uh, register. It's a free event. And we want to have a variety of industry stakeholders, cities, standards developers. We want to hear from everyone. I don't know if you have any last words, uh, Andrew. Here go. Um, well, I look forward to seeing people in Barcelona. Hopefully that's given a taste of some of the things that myself and people from other cities will be saying in what should be a really interesting debate around standards and uh, how you make them work for cities, smart cities. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, and thanks everybody for watching. Uh, goodbye for now.